Okay, we're, we're good to go. So welcome to our worship today at Mount Airy Presbyterian Church. Welcome all of those online that are joining us this morning and those who will join us later uh, when they watch later. Um, I want to just say a, a quick word of appreciation to our technical staff who do such a wonderful job making this online streaming possible. Uh, it's a real team, um, team effort, and they work really hard. You know, a lot of churches just put a camera up there and they just, you know, they just have the service and you just have the camera shot all the way through. But our team here, they put the words up, they put the scripture up and they just do a wonderful job. So uh, we really appreciate that. So welcome everybody. Um, this is the last weekend of January. Can you believe it? It's amazing. January has just flown by. Um, we're going to have a meditation verse and then the prelude. And then uh, Jerry's going to come up uh, as part of our welcome and uh, make a little announcement uh, to the congregation. Uh, and then we'll have our call to worship after that. So, um, Also, as, uh, as part of our uh, praise team today, we are, we're doing a little impromptu percussion. We added, decided at the last minute to add a little impromptu percussion. So uh, William Olson's going to come up and, uh, and do a little bit of percussion. And it's uh, very much an experiment. We hope you guys, uh, you know, we'll get some feedback from you maybe and see what you think. Uh, but, uh, you know, constantly um, trying to serve the Lord better and better. So uh, let's hear the meditation verse now from Romans 11 verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. making this announcement, I'm realizing how old I am, and you'll see why in a minute. Now that Pastor Dave has moved on to work with Ministry to State, you will see some changes as we fill the pulpit for the next uh, couple months. For now, I will continue to preach once a month, as I did last week. Steve Hollidge is here today to preach this week and the week after next. I'm glad uh, Steve's here. He was actually at my installation when I was an assistant pastor at CRPC in Laurel, Maryland. Next week, Jim Richwine will be here the whole weekend with his wife, Brooke, and she actually has a service dog named Cricket. He will preach and we hope uh, may become our interim pastor. You'll be hearing more about that right after the service today. And I see my age here because I was in the same presbytery as Jim at my first church 40 years ago. So, uh, yipes. Uh, I will then preach again. Then we'll have uh, Doug Lee, a retired PCA pastor. He was also the assistant chief of the military chaplains in the military. So it was quite a high position uh, to be over all the chaplains. We had... Um, adopted a chaplain that we, our church at the time, would um, pray for him regularly in his uh, ministry to the soldiers and also send them um, a pamphlets and Bibles that he could pass out. And I was talking to Doug Lee one time, who's going to be here, and he gave me a military challenge coin that I still have from that. So we wanted to tell you about all those things that are coming so that you know and especially uh, next weekend to be praying for that as uh, Jim Richwine will be amongst us and thankful for Steve today. Thank you, Jerry, appreciate that. And uh, we, we are indeed thankful to Steve and to the prospect of having Jim come and uh, work with us. So uh, God is good. Um, 
Our, uh, our friends down in Belize, when we would visit them, they would, uh, Pastor Betson, he would walk the streets of Belize and he would shout out, God is good all the time. And the people would shout back to him, Very good. That's good. That's right. Yeah. Good deal. Um, uh, we'll call the praise team up now, and uh, we'll hear the call to worship. The call to worship comes from Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, and 20 to 22. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. O oh, my soul. At this time, we'll have a time of singing. We'll stand and we'll sing. Our first song is going to be God of Wonders. It's uh, on the screen overhead. It's number 25 in the White Songbook if you want to follow along with music and if you can find a White Songbook. <laughs> uh, okay. Next song is How Great Is Your Love, How High and How Wide.
can imagine, greater than we can know. Let's hear the prayer of adoration. O oh, Holy Father, we come before you now. We lift up our hearts to you. Lord, we know that we cannot fully understand the breadth and the depth of the benefits that you lay upon us, that you pour out over us. Lord, we just magnify your name. We acknowledge that you are the creator, the sustainer, the one who has been from the beginning and will be to the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Lord, you have the angels in your service, the mighty ones who do your work. You have us, your people, who you have called to you to be ministers, to be um, voices speaking out your word. Lord, your dominion is complete. There is no place that you do not know. There is not anything you have not seen. There's nothing that exists that you have not created. No place, no person, no thing that you do not have dominion over. We lift you up now, we praise you, and we magnify your name. Lord, bless us as we come to you. Let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Through the work of Jesus, through his blood, we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Our Old Testament reading today comes from Isaiah, Isaiah 19, verses 19 through 24. Um, we're reading through the Old Testament, through the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah lived about uh, 700 years before Christ uh, was born and, and came to earth. Um, in this passage, he's looking back over the work that God had done uh, to Egypt in delivering the Israelites. Uh, he's reflecting on some of that. And he's also uh, talking about Assyria. At the time that Isaiah was prophesying this, Egypt and Assyria were warring against each other. So like they were on the headline news every day, you know, the war between Egypt and Assyria. And, um, and so um, this is a, a picture, a prophecy of God's redemption of the world, both Jews and Gentiles, through the work of our Savior Jesus. So let's uh, read together responsively Isaiah 19, 19 through 24. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. It will be a sign of the witness of the Lord of hosts of the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of oppressors, he will send them a savior. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians. And worship with sacrifice and offerings. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing, and they will return to the Lord. And he will listen to their pleas for mercy and And that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. And Egypt into Assyria. In that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. Praise God for his word to us. Our hymn of adoration is Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Number 53 in the Red Hymnal.
Thank you. Please be seated. So when I look around the congregation and, and the people online that are worshiping with us, I, I know them. I can imagine them. I can't see them, but I can imagine them sitting in their living rooms or family rooms. And I say, hey, th these are pretty good people. You know, I'm, I'm really, uh, there's a good group of people that, that we're part of here. And, you know, you may think about yourself sometimes. You may say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I have my quirks, I have my little issues, but, you know, all in all, I'm pretty good. <laughs> yeah, Jim, that's right. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we're going to look at what God has to say about who we are uh, in this passage. So, uh, sorry, sorry, no, but hey, God's word is truth, right? And so this is the truth, um, and, and there is hope. Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Let's come before the Lord now in a prayer of confession. Lord God, we come before you now, we sit under the truth of your word that has declared that we are corrupt. Lord, even if we kept your law perfectly from our youth, we would still be corrupt because we have inherited the sin of Adam, that sinful nature that is in us. Lord, we acknowledge now our sin before you. We acknowledge that we are corrupt. We don't seek after you. We seek after our own desires, our own pleasures. We seek to build ourselves up above you. But Lord, we know that we have hope because the rest of your scripture tells us that by the power of the Holy Spirit, through the work of Jesus, we can be renewed and restored, we can be redeemed, we can seek after you. Lord, the saving work of Jesus' sacrifice and the blessing of the Holy Spirit has made us possible, has made it possible for us to turn to you. We can be pure and not corrupt because of the righteousness of Jesus. We can do good in your eyes because our sins are washed clean and because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Lord, we ask now that you would bring us to confession, that we would repent of our sins, that we would be renewed day by day. We would come to you now, Lord, in a moment of silence, each of us personally confessing and repenting of, of those particular sins that we have. We take a moment now to do that before you, Lord, individually. Lord, thank you for your redemption. Thank you for your cleansing. As we trust in Jesus, as we look to him, Lord, strengthen our faith, draw us closer to you, and thank you for your redemption. In his name we pray, amen. All right, our hymn of assurance, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place, number 468. Let's stand and sing. My faith has found a resting place.
please be seated. Our New Testament scripture reading today comes from John 12, verses 9 through 19. Once again, uh, Jesus exposes the hearts of the chief priests who seek to protect their power uh, as rulers over the people rather than serve God. Let me read now John 12, 9 through 19. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had be, been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him then, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. At this time, children ages three to six can be dismissed to attend children's Bible time in classroom eight. Uh, we'll go before the Lord now in a uh, time of prayer, uh, giving thanksgiving and, uh, and intercession. A reminder, if you have a prayer request, uh, you can fill out a prayer card found in the lobby, and you can place it in one of the offering boxes uh, around the sanctuary. Uh, you can also contact the church office if you have any prayer requests. So uh, let's now go before the Lord in a time of thanksgiving and intercession. Lord God, merciful Father, we come before you now and we acknowledge that you are the giver of all good things. Uh, Lord, you give to us uh, many material blessings um, and you give to us many spiritual blessings, the greatest of which is our redemption through the blood of Jesus. Father, we would ask now that you would redeem those in our families who do not know you, that you would open their hearts and their minds, that they would see their need for you, their need for forgiveness, and that you would bring them to you. Lord, we pray for this, this particular body here, this church, as we are going through a time of transition, we ask that you would provide good leadership, that you would give the, the session and the deacons and the church staff wisdom and discernment. We ask the Lord that you would um, walk us through this process that we are beginning to enter now, and it will be done in a way that will glorify you and honor you. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our state and national government officials. We ask, Father, that you would work in their hearts, that they would seek to make decisions that would honor you and that would reflect your word and your will. Lord, we pray for those in our congregation who are caregivers. We ask that you would strengthen them, lift them up, and uphold them, as that task is very difficult and demanding, and we just ask that you would encourage and strengthen them. Help us, Lord, as a body to support them and to uh, come alongside them. Lord, we pray for our church ministries. We ask that you would bless them. We pray today particularly for the Frederick Rescue Mission and the Sober House, we ask that 
uh, men from our church would be able to faithfully bring the word of God uh, to those people there and that, uh, that they would be able to proclaim clearly your truth. Father, we would uh, bring before you now special needs, particular needs of this body. We pray for Sharon, uh, who now has pneumonia. Lord, we pray that the antibiotics that she is taking will work well, and we ask that you would provide her a full recovery. Lord, we pray also for Dan to stay healthy as he is taking care of her. Lord, we pray for Barb as she's undergoing radiation uh, over the next four weeks, um, starting tomorrow. Father, we ask you for um, your blessing on that. We ask that it would be effective. And we praise you, Father, for the testimony of Ken and Barb in this trial and for the grace and mercy that they are testimony to. Um, we thank you and ask that you would just continue to sustain them. Lord, we pray for Maxine as her leg is still showing signs of infection. We pray that new medication that she's taking will work and bring complete healing. We also pray for Tom's health, Lord, that you would sustain him and heal him. Lord, we pray for Karen, Maxine's sister, as she continues to recover from COVID. She has had multiple health issues, and we pray, Lord, that you would bring her healing. We pray for wisdom for her doctors and for relief of her pain, give her in increased strength, and uh, thank you for the signs of improvement that, uh, that she is seeing now. Lord, we pray for uh, Joe and Mary Sue. We ask that you uh, would bless them, Lord, and uh, see them through uh, the bout of COVID that, that they are experiencing. And we also ask, uh, Lord, that you would give Sue uh, wisdom and guidance as she considers further surgery on her eyes. Lord, we would pray for um, healing for Martha's mother, Posey, who has been hospitalized with COVID. We ask that you would strengthen and restore her. Father, we ask that you would bless Dave and Kathy in their transition to Dave's new calling to the Ministry of State. Lord, bless them in the decisions they have to make and in the, the, this new ministry that, that they are um, entering into. Lord, we pray also for Craig, that you would bring him relief and healing. We pray for Delora and Artis and Faye. Lord, you are the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. You are the great physician. Lord, we just ask that you bring healing to those in our congregation now who are suffering and to their families. Lord, we ask for Terry's, we pray for Terry's sister, Dottie, Rhonda's mother, Dolores, and Joe's daughter-in-law, Laura. Lord, bring them uh, healing, we ask. Father, we would also pray for our missions. We thank you for the privilege you've given us to support many missions throughout the world. We pray particularly now for a local mission for the Baltimore Antioch Leadership Movement and Craig, who is leading that. We uh, praise you, God, for the end of your donations that Balm received. We ask that you would bless the Metro Baltimore Seminary as, as they work with them. And we pray, Lord, for Maria's book, Stronger Together, that it would encourage believers and promote unity of the church in our nation. Lord, we pray that Balm would continue, be able to continue to train leaders and launch new churches uh, in the coming year. Lord, you are faithful to us. You are abundant in your goodness to us. We just are so thankful to you for all that you give us. Thank you for hearing our prayers because we pray them in the name of Jesus, who is our intercessor. Amen. All right, at this time, we will have the doxology, and then Steve will come up to bring us God's word.
Thank you. Please be seated. Well, I want to thank you all for your kind, warm welcome uh, to me this morning. I get to get around to a lot of churches, and uh, one of the uh, the benefits I can see is uh, often how the the worship leadership uh, kind of sets the preacher up for success and for encouragement. And so I was greatly ministered by your worship service this morning, uh, the sobriety, joyful sobriety of our great Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the great work he has accomplished on our behalf, uh, who fills us with joy unspeakable. Uh, and yet uh, it's, it's just a wonderful time to be here with you. Uh, I think the last time I was here was 20 years ago, uh, at least preaching. I, I might have been in the old building, so if you want to book me ahead for 2042, uh, you might want to get that in now. Uh, it's, dependent, it's dependent on whether the Lord gives me that long. I've asked the Lord for 25 more years, but uh, if you want to book me now, this is the time to do that. Uh, but it really is a great joy to be here. I know one of your elders, uh, Pete Brophy, he and I began the University of Maryland together and uh, had sweet times with Pete back in 1974 or 75. And uh, I, I don't know if he's here today. I, I looked around to see with us, or maybe he's online with uh, otherwise. But anyhow, so it's good to be here. Many ties over the years, including my sister-in-law and her husband, who are very kind. So uh, thank you for this time. I want to greet those who are online as well. Uh, we know that the Lord ministers to you while you're away, and yet that is not our, our great desire. Our desire is to be back together and to have the masks on. And as Mike was talking about seeing your wonderful eyes, I see your wonderful eyes too. But I'd like to see the complete face. Uh, and uh, if we have to wait till the Lord returns, so be it. But hopefully before then, uh, we'll get to see one another face to face. So let me pray for our time, and we'll look into God's word this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege above all privileges uh, of, that man can have. <clears throat> and that is to consider your word, to consider the word that is above all words. You have said through the psalmist in Psalm 36, 9, in your light we see light. And as we come together this morning, even as your children, we are dependent upon you to enlighten your word for us. So we ask for your tender mercies now, and we come with confidence, because you hear our prayers in, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've looked at the bulletin, you see that the uh, sermon is a very simple verse and a very simple theme this morning. The title is God's Light, a Simple Yet Profound Theme. And uh, our reading uh, text this morning is simply Psalm 119, 105. And that is, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And uh, that might seem like a very simple theme, and it is, but it's so profound. Uh, this is a theme that's all throughout Scripture. And it's particularly important for us as we consider as as Mike led us in our prayer of confession, that we are not what we were, that is mankind, from the time that we were first created. Something has intervened in the midst of that wonderful created order that God has accomplished uh, by his word, providing this wonderful tabernacle, this, this earth, which is a place where God had intended to meet with man, where he would meet with Adam and Eve and have fellowship with them, sweet fellowship. Of course, under the stipulation that they should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we'll get to there. But the world, the world still exhibits the beauty. If you saw the snow this, these past few days and the glorious beauty of the sky and the sunset and uh, of God's created order, it's always there. It's always there as a witness to God. You may have woken up this morning and saw that the temperature was in the teens and it was frigid and when you're up here, the wind just blows right through you. And I love cold weather, but man, it was chilly. It was so chilly, but I love it. And I thought, you know, why do we have this? Why do we have this cold weather? Well, first and foremost, it was begun by God's created order. When he created the world, he had seasons, and we, we have these times. But even after the flood, in Genesis 8.22, God says, I won't do this again to the world in this way. But there'll be seed time and harvest. There'll be warmth and cold. And these seasons will come and go. And so as we came this morning, 
even in the midst of the frigid air, it's a reminder that's from God's hand. It's his hand who has established the seasons. And so there will be a time when things will get warmer again, Lord willing, unless the Lord returns. But it's so important to see the foundations of even our everyday life in light of the word of God, that we have these seasonal changes because God has established them and, he's, and, and his strong hand has kept them firm. He's still ruling. But that's not all he's done. And so what I'd like to do under this idea of light this morning is look under four points. First, I want us to consider the effects of light in general. I want us to consider the effects of light in general. Second, I want us to think of the fact that God is light. The scripture testifies that God is light. Third, that the word of God is light. The word of God is light and as light. And then finally, what is the subject of of the word of God. What is the subject of the word of God? So first, I'd like for us to consider the effects of light. Now, I'm a little sad that I don't have all the children with me this morning, but uh, hopefully there's some children online as well, but it seems like, well, that's just, that's easy. It's just light. Light is bright. It gives us, it helps us see where we're going, and that's true. But we need to, just to slow down just a little bit to consider what does light really do for us? Now, I imagine from this location, we could get to Luray Caverns in about two hours. I don't know if you've ever been to Luray Caverns. It's a beautiful uh, scenic place. Uh, you go into the, you know, you go down into the caverns, and when you go on the tour, they tend to go into a room and they turn off all the lights, and you can't see anything. You can't see your hand in front of your face. And so when we think of light, we just think of just general visual acuity, right? Just so we can see things better. I don't know how many of you have been able to go to the dentist. I don't know what the COVID situation is affecting going to the dentist. But when you go to the dentist and you sit in that chair and you see that big light and the dental hygienist or the dentist will bring it over and you don't want to look into it because you know it's so bright. But what they want to do is focus that light in your mouth so that they can see things exactly the way they are. So they don't make any mistakes. They can see the cavities if you have them. They can see the work that they're doing. So they bring this, this bright, bright light to shine into your mouth to see what's going on. And so light just has a general uh, effect of making us see things for what they really are uh, just visually. You know, one of the things I was going to ask my young friends is, how many of you have been to the beach over the last year? Any of my, my young friends been here to the beach? All right, let me, okay, let me ask you, what do you bring to the beach? What are some things you like to bring to the beach? And for those at home as well, is there, are there certain things when you go to the beach you think, I'm going to bring this, maybe a float, something to ride the waves on, or if you're a younger child, maybe you bring a sand bucket or, or something like that. But let me ask you, do you all bring flashlights to the beach? You don't. You know, like on a, a late July day or early August day when it's 100 degrees and there's no clouds in the sky and the sun's beaming down, why wouldn't you bring a flashlight? It wouldn't make any sense, right? You know, if you've ever been to a very crowded beach, you see people walking around trying not to step on people's towels and things. If you saw me with a flashlight walking around, you would say, what are you doing, man? Get me out of your mind. Well, I don't want to step on you. I just want to make sure I, could, I want to find a spot. And they would say, sir, the sun is so much brighter. You don't need a flashlight. This is absurd. It's absurd. In fact, I was even wondering if I had a flashlight and I was able to put it on the, the sand, I don't think I would even see the light of the flashlight. It would be canceled by the light of the sun. And yet we need to think about that, that God's word is like that. It cancels all other words. It's brighter than any other light in the world. Brighter, oh, I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. You saw my lip for a second ago, right? And so we need light for just general visual clarity. Okay, and so that's what the word of God does for us as well. But secondly, we think of light as giving insight. I used to watch a lot of cartoons, and there would be somebody who was confused, and all of a sudden there would be this bubble cloud, and there would be a light bulb going off. Now I get it. Now I understand. 
Maybe you've been at school at some point during your, your, your time of education and you hear the, the professor or the teacher teaching, whether, wherever you're getting educated at, and you hear it, it's like, I don't get it, I don't get it, and then bing, now I get it, now I understand. One definition for insight is penetrating mental vision or discernment, faculty of seeing into the inner character or underlying truth. And so that's what we want. This is what uh, God's word does for us as well. And we'll look into this in just a second. But we want to think about how, when we think about light, that's what it does. It helps us to see things for the way they really are. Over the course of my life, I played a lot of sports. I was a physical education teacher. I played many sports in high school, which meant I had lots of injuries. And over the course of my life, I would go get many x-rays on ankles or whatever parts of my body. Now, what's the point of an x-ray? It's to see beneath the skin to see what's really going on. You could have a break and you wouldn't even know it until the x-ray demonstrates, oh, by the way, that is broken. At one point, my youngest son had an injury and we took him to, like, to an emergency room and they were jerking on his arm. They thought he had dislocated his elbow. Turned out he had broken his elbow. And fortunately, we got him to a, somebody had much more wisdom and we saw that there was a break on the growth plate all of that time was wasted and hurtful because we didn't, they didn't know exactly what was going on. And even x-rays have a limited ability. All they can do is, is kind of show you the bones. But I've had places in my life where I get the x-ray, doesn't give us enough light, let's get an MRI. And the MRI is incredible where you can see the soft tissue damage. And they can say, oh, yeah, we see what's going on now. But what's the point of that? It's, it's to see beyond just what the, the surface has. And so all these, these great gifts that God has given us in the medical world d- disclose to us things that are hidden and show us what's really going on. And so that's another benefit of light in and of itself. And so we want to know, we want to see things for what they really are. We want to see things for what they really are. And this verse that we're considering this morning says, God's word does that for us. It discloses things for what they really are. It is a light that is like no other light in the world, like no other light in the world. And so we've considered these effects of light, but second, we want to think of the reality that God himself is light. God himself is light. Now, I imagine that it took some preparation for you all to come here this morning, to, you know, particularly if you have young children. I, we raised four kids through the church. I know it takes a lot to get them together, get them in the car, get them all focused. Here we go. We're going to worship. And you're kind of used to coming to worship all the time. But one of the things I'd like for myself and for you all as well is to remember every time, every time you hear the word of God, you're hearing a word of light you will hear nowhere else in the world. It's from heaven above. It is the word of God. It will dispel the darkness and the small light that man has in and of himself. What a wonderful time to consider God's word as we saw the call to worship and as we considered the prayer of confession. That God's word is there washing us, cleansing us, reviving us, telling us what's really true. As Mike reminded us, we're sinners, and we've sinned this past week. And we need to come back every Lord's Day and to hear the word, yes, we've sinned, Lord. And then to see Christ presented before us, the Christ who has come to bear our sins. And so God is light. It's no surprise that his word would be light, because he is a being of light. This theme is so prevalent in John's writings, in his gospel, in his epistles. John 1, 5 says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. No darkness at all. You know, all of us have some measure of light, I, I, I trust, as we gather this morning. But then there's other things. There's matters of darkness. There might be pressing concerns, health concerns. There might be this, you know, this last two or three year cloud that we've had over us regarding COVID. I think one of the most difficult things, and I've seen this in almost every church, there is this lingering cloud of discouragement about COVID because we just can't see it. We don't see it for what it is. We can't tell all the time what's going on. 
and the uncertainty really wears on us after a while. But God has none of that. He has none of those uh, problems because he is light itself. He knows every germ of COVID. He knows every strain of COVID. He knows every sickness in the world. He He has no need of additional information because he is truth itself. And we need to think about that, particularly at this time when we're so unsettled. There may be some uncertainties for you. I know that you're going through a transition. This is the fifth church I've preached at where there's been transitions. And it's hard because we don't know what's next. But God does. God does. And he loves us. And he'll never leave us nor forsake us. It's God himself who has pushed the pause button for Mount Airy. Not to torment you, but to lead you to move toward Christ more and to trust him more and to see see his provision more. There's nothing unusual that your congregation is going through that other congregations have gone through as well. I'm so glad that you're going to have this gentleman coming next week, this interim pastor. I've started to see this pop up in more and more churches, and what a great blessing it is to kind of help the church settle and figure out what the Lord's really calling them to, and then having accomplished that, to look forward to what's next. Who should we call? What's the kind of man we need for this church as we move forward? It is a great, great blessing. But we need to remember that although we are confused, and although we may have some measure of darkness, God has none. Think about David in Psalm 139. He says, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, Do you feel like the darkness of this time has covered you? And the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. The night is as bright as the day. You know, I spoke about being in that cave, and we don't see, you know, when you go in those caves and they turn the lights off, you can't see it. It's like light to God. It's just like light to God. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Now, it's not true for us, but it is true for our Lord who loves us and who will not forsake us. And we need to rest in that reality. We are not God. We are not all-knowing. He has revealed himself to us in his word for our salvation for our good, for our building us up in Christ, but we don't know everything. And he wants us to trust him, and he wants us to wait on him, and he wants us to rest in Christ. And so that we see the effects of life, light, we see that God is light, it's no surprise, and there's no darkness in him. He's never confused. We might be confused, but he's not confused. And we just have to wait on him. Another thing that the word of God does for us is that it takes us to places that we just don't see with in this world. If you if you never read the word of God, it would be so easy to be a materialist that all you know is what you see. All there is is what I see. But when you go to the word of God, it starts to reveal greater realities. It tells you that you are a creature created by God in his own image. It tells you that you are a creature who has been under the fall, and so you've been affected by the fall. It tells you that God has created the the whole universe. It's all his created order. And that you and I are dependent creatures upon God. Even before the fall, Adam and Eve were dependent on God as creatures. They were not God. And yet the fall has had a, a, a catastrophic effect upon us. We think we're autonomous. We think we're in control. And then God sends difficulty, and we realize we don't have any idea what's going on. I have no control over these situations, whether it's illness or relational situations. But God is in control. I contracted COVID about three or four weeks ago. And I wasn't really concerned about COVID, to be honest. And it it knocked me out. It was the sickest I've been in a long time. I'm still, I'd say 80%. I'm, 
I'm at 20, 20%, I feel, energy-wise. I have no idea how I got it. God knows. He knows where I contracted it. I don't know. But all these things God knows, and we do not. And he just calls us to trust him by his word and to wait upon him. The word discloses all these things for us as he speaks of these things. So we're not surprised that the word of God is light because he is a being of light. He is a being of light. So I want to talk about, I want us to consider the fact that when we come to the word, there's no neutrality. There's no neutrality with the word. We get this invitation from God in Proverbs 22, 17 to 18. Incline your ear, hear the words of the wise, and apply your heart to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, if all of them are ready on your lips. God invites us to come into his word, to take up his word, to be filled with his word, that we would shine into our hearts. This is a great privilege. That's why when we come to worship, it's no small benefit. We get to come here. But at the same time, there's a, there's a warning. God warns us in his word about uh, neglecting his word. So, Proverbs 21, 16. One who wanders from the way of, the, of good sense will rest in the assembly of, dead, of the dead. One who wanders from the way of good sense will rest in the assembly of the dead. What a horrible picture. You see, there's no neutrality with God's word. Either you receive it and, and learn from it and sit under it, or it will break you. There is no neutrality. You can't just say, I don't care. You can't do that. There are consequences to neglecting the word of God. Proverbs 15, 5. A fool despises his father's instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is prudent. That God has given us his word that we don't have to be stupid anymore. We don't have to be foolish. I trust that many of you here, some of you are my age, have seen the movie The Wizard of Oz. And throughout the whole movie in The Wizard of Oz, there's this great fear of the wizard. And they're always trembling and one you know, in fear. And they get to the end of the movie. And Toto pulls the curtain back. And we see things for what they really are. There was this imaginary wizard, and there's an old man, probably my age, behind the stage. And, and what is he? It's nothing. And this is what the word of God does for us. It enlightens us into the way things are in the world. It enlightens us into the way things are in the world. But we have this other greater warning from Jesus himself about how important it is for the light of God's word to be in our hearts. Jesus says, the light is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? How great is the darkness? Have you ever considered that? That if what you think is true is a lie, how great is the darkness? I had a dear brother that I, I spent some time with over three weeks. The first week I heard him talking about his back. His back was bothering him. He had been in a lot of pain. The second week I happened to run into him again. I said, hey, how's your back? He said, it's not good. The third week I heard that he had cancer. The pain that was in his back was cancer. It wasn't a pulled muscle. It wasn't something like that. He was a busy man. He probably just thought, oh, I'll get through it. He died within a year. Cancer had riddled his body. How sad it was that he thought, oh, it's just probably a muscle ache or something. And it took his life. He went to be with the Lord within a year. And so that's why we need the word of God to keep coming to us and enlightening us more and more and more so we're not deceived. We're not deceived by the voices that we hear in the world. Ever since the created order, there's only been two voices. When God made man, he, he created this wonderful tabernacle, this wonderful place where he would meet with him in this world. And he gave him his word. And he says, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
That's the word of God. The word of God is always true. It never lies. It always tells us the truth. But in the midst of that time, there was another voice that came in. Did God really say? Did God really say? And starts to create doubts and, and ease mind. And then finally he blatantly says, you, shall, shall, you surely shall not die. You surely shall not die. Blatantly contradicting the word of God. That's just the beginning of mankind. And so what do they do? They listen to the lie. And here we are today in a fallen world. A fallen world. God's word is always true. And God's word has continued to come through us down through history. He's given his word through his people Israel. And now he gives it to us now in the New Testament in his son Jesus Christ. In the midst of all the darkness in the world, the word of God still goes forth from his church, from his pulpits. But there's many, many satanic lying puppets we have. You turn on the internet, you turn on television, lie after lie, different iterations of lies that are false. And it's hard to, it's hard to be discerning. But how do you become discerning? By being in the word. By coming back to the light and to say, oh, that's an imposter because the word of God says this. Oh, that's a lie because the word of God says that. It's just like that pulling back of the curtain at the end of The Wizard of Oz. I see it for what it is. It's a lie. It's a temptation. And God warns his people all throughout Scripture, be discerning. But we don't have it in and of ourselves. We need the word of God to enlighten us in these things. It's hard to know the difference between what's true and not sometimes. But when we come to the word, it's light sheds light on this situation. It's like, oh... Now I get it. I mentioned that I had a history with Pete Brophy. Uh, he and I started at the University of Maryland together. And one time I was at the University of Maryland, and I was in a parking lot. And this gentleman came across the parking lot and said, hey, hey, man, you got $20. My battery died. I got to get a new, get a new battery. And I was, a, I was a kind of a kind guy. I said, OK. And as he walked away, I realized, there's no battery stores around here. <laughs> you know, if I was in a cartoon, I would start looking like a Tootsie Roll pop, and it would say sucker uh, across the, the pop, and it would go wah, 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 wah. I was taken. I was taken. I didn't have discernment. But, you know, with the light of God's word and experience in life, I was like, sorry, bud, I'm not going to give you the 20 bucks anymore, you know? And so that's what the word of God, it keeps coming back to us and showing us what things are like in the world. Do you realize that this word has a one-to-one -one correlation with this world? It's here for us so that we don't have to walk in darkness anymore. We don't have to walk in darkness anymore. So we see, first, the effects of life. Second, God is light. Third, the word of God is light. And finally, the subject of the word of God. What is the subject of the word of God? There's so many things to learn in God's word. But is there a main theme or a main subject? And I know you know the answer. It's absolutely yes. The subject of the word is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Lord Jesus Christ himself. It's not on my authority. It's not on your blessed session's authority. It's not on the PCA's authority. It's on the Lord Jesus Christ authority himself. Luke 24 is the Washington Monument of the scripture. You may know that the Washington Monument is the highest point in D.C. And you can go to the top. I haven't been there since 1965. I try to go every 50 years, so I'm a little behind. But you can go to the top, and you can look out, and you can get a lay of the whole land. You can get a lay of the whole land of D.C. because it's the highest point. And Luke 24 twice tells us the lay of the land of the Old Testament, that it's all about Jesus. You remember Jesus spoke to those two, two men on the road to Emmaus, and afterwards they said, did not our hearts burn within us? Did not our hearts burn within us? I tried to figure out how long that, that walk was. You know, I have CDs of sermons of many great men, but I would love to have had a CD of that 
message that Jesus gave, where he would say, you know back in Genesis 3.15 about the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman? I'm the seed of the woman. You know when you get to Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, the one on whom God has laid our sins, I'm the suffering servant. And going through the Old Testament, demonstrating over and over and over again that Jesus is the subject. Jesus is the subject. And again, I said there's twice in, in, in Luke 24, we hear this. Uh, in Luke 24, 44 to 48, we got this. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is preaching himself to these men. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You know, the disciples would see things happen in, in, in time and space, in real time, and they didn't know what they meant. But you read the Gospels and said, we didn't know it back then, but then when he rose from the dead, then we understood it. Even during Jesus' time, he was revealing himself all the way up to the cross, and he didn't get it. They didn't comprehend it. But the whole Old Testament was talking about Jesus. Now, I came to Christ through the ministry of young life. And I started to have a burning love for Christ. And I, I love the New Testament, but man, the Old Testament was like a maze. You know, I knew there were stories about Abraham and things like that, but I didn't have any great love for the Old Testament. But for a while, I got to study with Palmer Robertson. You probably know some of his books on covenants. And he said, the Old Testament's about Jesus. What? It's about Jesus? And I started to go to the Old Testament. It would be passage after passage. It's like opening presents on Christmas morning. And every one of them is Jesus Christ. Jesus is all throughout the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I wish I had more time just to, to read and meditate more and more. To still like, oh, look how much God loves us in Christ. Look how Christ is betrayed all throughout the Old Testament. Types and signs. He's the prophet that would come after Moses. He was the priest that would come after Samuel. He was the king that would come after David. They all come together in him. This wonderful, wonderful gift that God has given us of the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I wish I knew more of it because it speaks of Jesus. It gives us a greater understanding of what he has done. When we look at the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, what's the point? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And yet the writer to the Hebrews tells us, the blood of bulls and goats will not take away sins. It was like a pedagogical endeavor that God had given his people to say, you need the blood, you need the shedding of the blood, you need to put your hand on the head of the sacrifice. And, and his purity, the spotless lamb of God, or the spotless animal is transferred to you, and your sins are transferred to the animal, and the animal dies. But in Isaiah 53, it says, He has laid on him the sins of us all. God has put his, our sins on Christ, his son himself. He did what we could not do. And he is our sin bearer. And he gives us his righteousness as we trust in him. That's what the whole Old Testament is trying to tell us. It's pointing us to Jesus, the one to come. And so Jesus is the subject matter, not just of the Old Testament, but of the New. It's pretty obvious in the New. But the Old is all about Jesus. So what was Jesus doing when he came and he died on the cross? What did he do? We have two wonderful, wonderful passages in the New Testament that really succinctly tell us. Colossians 1.20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That when Jesus died on the cross, he was bearing our sins for us. God is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in him. And we needed, we needed our sins to be forgiven. But we were a rotten, 
sacrifice. We were a spoiled sacrifice. We were a blemished sacrifice. And so God could look out of all mankind and there was no one who could pay for our sins. So he sends his beloved son in whom he's well pleased and he takes on human flesh and he becomes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He never sinned. He never sinned in action. He never sinned in word. He never sinned in thought. He never sinned in affection. Have you ever considered that? When you think about your thought life as we were confessing our sins, you know, you you have a, a lustful thought. You have an angry thought. Jesus had none of that. He was always focused on one thing, and that was to obey the Father no matter what. And he goes to the cross because he wanted to be perfectly obedient to his father. And all this time, he had perfect fellowship with the father until the cross. And he's on the cross. He's obedient to the father. That's his will. That's his food and drink. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's silence. There's a song, the father turns his face away. Jesus was bearing our sins. And for the first time in his whole existence, that fellowship was broken as the God-man hung on the cross. And he says, it's finished. It's finished. The apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 6, 1 says this, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. That is the message of this pulpit. That is the message of Mount Airy, the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. You see, the the message of the church is a finished work. It's the finished work of Christ. It is the payment that he has made on behalf of mankind who would trust in him for the forgiveness of their sins. We talk of a, we have a resurrected Lord and he has reconciled us to himself. Now, there's many benefits that we have in Christ. There's many benefits that we have in Christ, but I think the, the chief one that I most overlook, and maybe you do too, is that he brought us near to himself. He drew drew us near to himself. I assume you have, some of you have friends that are lifelong friends, maybe they're your sister or your brother or somebody you grew up with. You know, I told you I've known Pete since 1964, I'm sorry, 1974, 75, and I'd like to catch up with him. Lots Lots has happened. But when you have a friend who knows you over all that time, they, they anticipate you, they know you so well. And you see, the the fall made us stupid. It made us autonomous. And we were never created autonomous. So that as we gather this morning, and as you look toward the future, and you say, I need help, it's like, yeah, you do need help. But in Christ, we have the help we need. He will guide this congregation as you go through your next days and weeks and years. Because Christ has already paid for our sins. And we can draw near now. You know, I will confess this sin of mine when I pray. You know, the scripture tells us, if a son asks his father for a fish, will he give him a serpent? And I confess in my fallenness, I still wait for that serpent. I still wait for that serpent. You know what that displays? I don't trust the sacrifice of Christ enough. I don't trust that he has reconciled me to himself enough. I don't trust that he sees me in Christ now. I don't trust that when I pray, he, and I pray in the name of Christ, that he hears me as his beloved son. That is ours now. 
in Christ. And that is the message of the word of God. And that's why we need to keep coming back every Lord's Day and being involved in studies and reading the word ourselves, that we have the light washing over us and washing over us. Because to our last breath, we're going to doubt and we're going to have fears. And we need to hear once again, I have paid for your sins. You are mine. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, your word, your, your, the world scoffs at your word and thinks very little of it. And we confess that we do not hold it as we ought. This dear, precious gift where we, we learn of our beloved Jesus all throughout the pages from Genesis to Revelation. Father, we ask that you would overrule our darkness with the light of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. So that as we gather as your people, whether here at Mount Airy or wherever we might be, that the light of your word would, would enlighten us and, and take us out of our remaining darkness, the, re, the remaining corruption of our lives. Father, we ask that we would not grow weary in your corrections, your, your kind, fatherly corrections, where you make us more and more like your son. We thank you for this time this morning to consider your word, and we ask that we would leave with this, that the work is finished, that we would rejoice in your tender mercies towards us in Christ, and that we would go out this week with full confidence that we are Christ and you are for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Steve, for that word. Let's, uh, let's finish now with a hymn. Be Thou My Vision. Stand and sing. <laughs>
close our service now in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you, Lord, that the work of Jesus is complete. We ask now that you would bring us out into the world, proclaiming that light to the world around us. Thank you for this time of worship. Bless us as we go from here. In the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior, amen. Before you depart, uh, I wanted to make an announcement here. As you know, we're in the midst of a process to find a senior pastor for our church. And uh, we've, we've studied the process a bit and have been persuaded that we want to have an interim pastor to help us through um, that process. And so the next step is to call an interim pastor who will help guide the church during the transition. We're looking for a man who can better un- help, help us to better understand who God has called us to be as a church and how to identify a pastor that can help us fulfill that calling. That interim pastor will not ultimately become our senior pastor, but will help us to find that senior pastor. And so we have a possible candidate for interim pastor. His name is Jim Richwine, and he and his wife, Brooke, will be visiting our church over the next weekend. He'll preach next Sunday, and he will also lead the Sunday school hour to explain how the transition process would work if he were to be our interim pastor. And we'll also have a less formal opportunity to meet with him and Brooke on Saturday, at 5 p.m., we'll have a soup and salad dinner here at church with them. And on the board outside, uh, the glass doors, is a sign-up sheet if you would like to come to that. That's this coming Saturday. Um, if you're not able to, to sign up today because you need to talk it over with your family or if you're um, remote today, you can also call the church office and let them know that you're coming. And we're asking everyone who comes to bring soup and families with last names starting with A through L to bring a dessert and M through Z to bring a salad. Per our church government, the decision whether or not to call Jim as an interim pastor falls to the session, but we and Jim both want to know your thoughts as well. And so after the Sunday school hour next week, we'll be holding an advisory vote so the congregation can weigh in as to whether or not to call Jim as our interim pastor. And immediately after that, the session will convene to uh, make a final decision. Directly afterwards also will be a time of coffee and fellowship for anyone who wants to stick around and learn the results. We've been in contact with Jim for about a month. We've listened to his sermons, have heard some about his plans and his philosophy of interim pastoring, and we're excited about this possibility. So we encourage you, if you can, to participate in this time in the life of the church. And whether you can attend or no, please pray for wisdom for the congregation. As the book of James says, If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Thank you. Thank you.